My name is Michael Brauner. I'm the founder of Harlequin's Gardens Plant Nursery, which is here, and we developed these gardens uh, actually before the nursery started. When we first got here, this ground had not a tree on it, no shrubs, no perennials, uh, just bare ground. And uh, the, the water supply here is extremely limited. Um, even the nursery, even with the nursery, we're, we're operating the whole thing out of three cisterns. Two on this side and one on the wholesale side. So everything that's growing here was started off by being watered by hand. All of these gardens have been uh, time tested and drought tested. All of the trees, the shrubs, the roses, the, this garden here, everything that's growing um, has been um, managed with very little water and just with a little uh, soil prep. This garden itself, you might say, it's a garden of a, of a very busy old person um, uh, after the spring bloom. So it's not a garden that you might uh, see on uh, the cover of Fine Gardening magazine, but um, I'm very proud of this garden. Um, and what I'm really proud of is the fact that the garden, that nature is able to produce this much beauty and resilience without a lot of my care. I used to spend a lot more time here, but I don't have the time for it anymore. And still, even though there's a lot of weeds in here, um, it still looks nice. It, one of the things I'm proud about here is that the garden has been watered between four and seven times a year for the last 30 years. Another thing that I'm proud of with this garden is that we've never used any pesticides or herbicides or fungicides on the garden ever. And, um, and that in terms of care, we do um, give it some compost sometimes. We, we um, give it some minerals sometimes and once in a while a little fertilizer. But largely the, these plants have naturalized. I still add things once in a while, but I don't have a lot of time for that anymore. And so these plants have naturalized and the tough have survived. And, um, uh, and it's really basically at this point, nature taking care of itself. And that's what's so wonderful is that even with a little care, um, once you have the reasonable soil preparation and some good bones, some good shrubs and, and whatnot, um, nature is really powerful and this garden will look not very different from this even if we should have serious climate change problems. Um, it's already been drought tested. Um, they shut off the water to a lot of people. This garden will still continue because it's used to drought. We, we grow a lot of natives here. The natives obviously are, have also tested stood the test of time um, and so they belong here and so a lot of them are perfectly adapted to here and and uh, and have done very well um, this tree is, which is usually um, talked about as a shrub is curl leaf mountain mahogany and it's about in time for a prune here take a little bit off the top but it's been here for 35 years. It's one of the oldest plants in my garden. And it is a broad-leafed evergreen, which is very unusual that a broad-leafed evergreen can stand in full sun in Colorado winter sun. Um, but the only thing it can't handle is shade. So right across from us is a non-native. And this is a European elderberry, very uh, important berries for uh, our immune system, um, very good pollinator uh, plant. A lot of, a lot of um, uh, bees appreciate these kind of clusters of flowers. Right behind it is an Arizona cypress. The, um, they're uh, generally not thought of as hardy in our area, but Alan Taylor from the University of Colorado found uh, this growing on a high mountain in Arizona and, and has brought it here and, and, and look how successful it is. Um, 
So other natives, this garden over here is almost exclusively natives. Um, in the background, there is a, ha there is a hackberry tree, um, Celtis occidentalis, that um, is, is one of the, the most drought tolerant, big shade trees for our area. Um, this is um, three-leaf sumac, which is a native of our foothills here, and it will uh, it, it stands a considerable amount of drought. In fact, I should begin by saying this entire garden is never watered. It was watered a, a couple times when it was first planted. It was watered once in the drought of 2002. After that, it has not been watered. So. You know, we have these interesting choyas. This is the sort of yellow green choya. This is the pink one. The red one, the red purple one is just starting to bloom over there. Behind this, there's a gamble oak. And, um, and this is a patchy plume. And behind that is a very unusual tree called Telea, P-T-E-L-E-A. And if I don't know, you can see there's a there's a swallowtail butterfly right now um, fluttering around the blossoms of the telium. And uh, that is uh, uh, not thought of as a, a very drought tolerant tree, but it's been there for many, many years. It doesn't get much bigger than 12, 15 feet, um, but it does get these yellow, very pale yellow uh, blossoms in the spring, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and after that it gets these fairly large disc-shaped seeds. Um, in front of this is uh, Chilopsis linearis. It's called desert willow, even though it's not a willow, and it will be blooming fairly soon with these orchid-like flowers. It's really quite a, a remarkable plant that uh, is related to a catalpa. Um, but um, it also, in spite of the fact that it looks like an orchid, is never watered. This is the, the choya. And you can see the purple blooms are just now starting to come out on that. Behind that, there is a lead plant. It's a little hard to see right now. It's sort of gray-blue foliage. The flowers will be coming out soon. And back behind that, we're not totally purists around here. That's not a native. Back there, that's a, um, a Russian hawthorn and perfectly adapted to Colorado. It stands a lot of the same conditions that our natives do. Plus, it has flowers uh, for the bees and uh, fruit for the birds. So in the middle of the garden, is a golden rain tree. And golden rain tree is not a native, but it's totally drought tolerant. And uh, it's a little weedy in that it makes a lot of seeds that uh, you sometimes have to dig out. But, um, but, um, but it's a beautiful tree. It blooms with flowers in July uh, when nothing else seems to be blooming. Uh, this is a selection of our golden currant, Ribes aureum, called Gwen's buffalo, and it's selected for fruit. And uh, even though this has really only been watered, I think, two or three times this year, you can see it still has fruit on it. Uh, it would have more if we watered it more, but um, it's doing quite well and blooms and fruits every year. And then as we're coming down here, there's, um, this is a selection of our native um, common mountain mahogany. It's going to get much bigger. And then next to that is a say, uh, one of our native sages, sand sage, Artemisia filifolia. And then next to that is a southwestern native grass called Wright's Sacaton, Sparabolus wrightii, and that will get probably five feet with the grass and seven feet with the plumes. And next to, the, next to that is a rather unusual specimen of, of um, 
Forestiera New Mexicana, the New Mexican privet, which is not a privet at all, but a rather drought tolerant um, native shrub from the southwest. Let's let's enter the garden here. This is a um, this is a boxwood that I have boneside in a pot here with a with a Turkish Veronica uh, crawling over the sides. This is our native juniper Juniperus scopulorum, the Rocky Mountain juniper. Um, this is a rather old specimen of a boxwood. People think, oh, you can't grow a boxwood in a xeriscape garden, but of course we do. And here it is, looking really quite splendid. Um, and uh, it's a Mediterranean plant, so it really isn't, um, even though it's probably popularized as an English plant, it really is a Mediterranean plant, so it is adapted to drier conditions. Um, and this is an Asian euonymus um, that makes a nice little tree. And this is a, 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 a viburnum. It's a special cross of a viburnum. It has beautiful fall color and flowers and fruits. Um, it's not getting as much water as it would like, but it's doing fine. This is our native cliff rose. Um, and... Um, it's getting a little more shade than it would like. It's leaning out this way, but it uh, has beautiful flowers that support the pollinators. And right next to that is a very unusual um, specimen for our garden. It's a, it's a lily. It's a martagon lily um, that I never expected to survive here, but my wife convinced me to plant it as a bulb, and there it is. And then right at the base of that is an evergreen shrub called um, Dwarf Mountain Lover, which was a plant select plant, um, and uh, amazingly tough and, and resilient. Um, and then this is a maple, which is a relation related to Norway maple, but it is um, Acer truncatum. And uh, uh, I'm keeping it as a relatively small tree but it is more drought tolerant than, than uh, Norway maple and um, uh, is f fitting in quite well here. And then kind of in this area, this is the east side of the house. And so being the east side of the house, it, um, it, it doesn't get the late afternoon sun and it doesn't get the west wind. So here is where I put some roses and other things that 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 wouldn't survive out in the the blast of our area. We're we're um, we have a lot of sun out here, and the west wind is quite fierce. So here on the east side of the house, we can have roses, and also I'm I'm um, I have some of my my bonsai collections here, and. Um, This is a, a vine called porcelain vine, which will have porcelain blue berries later in the season. This is an evergreen oak, Quercus uh, turbinella, is sort of in just getting started. Um, it's probably three years old in my very uh, dry garden, um, but uh, it will eventually get probably four, five, six feet high. Um, another boxwood. And another boxwood back there. And so these are, these are um, a very drought tolerant um, uh, salvias. They're, it's clary sage. Um, and um, it, as you may see, it has sewed itself around quite a bit. Um, but for me, it's not a pest. I like it, and it's, it's good for the bees, and so I, I let it move around. So this obviously is an aspen tree, and in spite of the fact that um, there's talk that aspens don't belong at this elevation, I've had aspens in my xeriscape garden for 35 years, and they seem to do quite nicely. My experience as an arborist is that aspens need uh, good drainage. They don't want to be planted in wet lawns. But here in my garden, even though it's been raked over by the deer, it's doing quite well and quite happy.
So this is an apple tree. Unfortunately, I didn't know that Jonathan apples were susceptible to fire blight, so I planted it way back then, and it has fi had, had fire blight ever since, and some years it's not bad, and this year it's bad. Here, we're just, this is a, uh, an American wisteria, and it's just finishing its bloom. It's going to get better and better as it gets older, but uh, I had originally planted a Japanese wisteria here, which has much bigger blossoms that happen before the leaves come out, and it's very dramatic, but it, sometimes they take 10 years before they bloom, and then they don't bloom every year. Sometimes they only bloom every one or three or four or five years. This American wisteria, wisteria macrostachia, this blooms every year once it gets started. So it's just gonna to get to be stronger and stronger plant. This is an example of one of the Canadian roses that we really love and uh, promote here at Harlequin's Gardens because they are so cold hardy on their own roots. They can live a long time and um, disease resistant and um, cold hardy um, and uh, great performers for Colorado landscapes. And this is another one. This is one called Victorian Memory uh, or Isabella Skinner is its, is its old name. And um, this uh, is a great climber. It can get to 15 feet. This is one of the shrubs. This is a cotoneaster called Red Bead Cotoneaster. And it is one of the plant select uh, shrubs, Scott Scogerbo. Uh, from Fort Collins Wholesale Nursery, um, found out about this plant from the old director of the Cheyenne Station and got cuttings from them. And it's a terrific, amazing plant. It's sitting up here on the hill, not getting very much water and big. And the flowers are quite showy, lots of berries for the birds um, and drought tolerant and very tough. We like it. These, this is, um, uh, a globe mallow and it's it's one of the tall it will get actually six seven eight feet tall with orange flowers and uh, the bees just love it it's really a popular plant amongst the pollinators um, very very drought tolerant spreads a little bit it's not a problem um, and um, great great plant for a native garden There you can see a little bit of the sulfur flower, Ariaganum umbellatum, our native. This is a selection that Plant Select has promoted called Canna Creek. The foliage turns a beautiful mahogany red in the fall. So at this point, um, well, let's just take a little shot right here because um, in the foreground, you can see there's another Canadian rose. In the background, this is Laburnum alpinum. It's actually the golden chain tree, uh, but it's from, a, it's from a much hardier selection than what you normally find in the nursery. I grew this from seed 20 years ago. So, um, uh, and it bloomed beautifully this year. And next to this is a lilac. Lilacs are very well adapted to, to Colorado and so we, we, we promote them a lot. Um, this garden here is uh, somewhat deteriorated, but it is a, a, a garden that is are examples of various ground covers that can be used. Um, originally, I thought that they would be used uh, to replace lawns. And so, and I think that actually is happening. People are taking out their lawns and putting in other kinds of plants and ground covers are one that can be used. So these give people a, usually a three by three sized area to see what they look like, um, uh, not in just a little two and a half inch pot. So we need to fix these up. We need to replant, but we've been very busy this year. Um, So all of these plants that are growing here, all, they all came um, uh, 
from us. We planted them. We watered them to get them established. And anything that wasn't pretty darn tough has gone. So here in the, in, the, in the foreground here, we have a Chinese uh, ephedra. Behind that, there is a buffalo, a native buffalo berry. Um, behind that, we have a New Mexican locust. To the left, we have another hackberry and a ponderosa pine. And then in the foreground here, we have a, a little leaf Mount Mahogany. Um, just like that big one that we first saw that was like 15 feet tall, um, this one has uh, very tiny leaves and it only gets about five feet tall, but it has the same um, drought tolerance and, um, and evergreen foliage as the big one. Um, so then this is, this is a, a, a yucca, uh, which obviously is very drought tolerant. And there's a little Chinese rose, which I got from seed and planted and has been made amazingly tough. One of the most drought tolerant roses I've ever seen has a, 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 a spectacular display of rose hips in the fall. Um, kind of a prickly rose, but um, well adapted. So this has, been, this has been excavated, so it's a little, it's a little unlike what ours looked like. Ours look kind of more like what you see over there before that excavation. Over there and over there. But you can see there's, um, it's mostly uh, just very extremely drought tolerant plants. This yellow flower is called Heterotheca villosa. Um, and it's, it's kind of a weed on, in, on, on my gardens over here, but I like it because it uh, fills in areas where nothing else is growing. So this garden is what we call our, our new western garden. And it, by that we mean that it, it looks like what you might imagine would do well in the west and these plants do well here with very little care and very little water. There's not a lot of perennials at this point because we don't have enough time to take a lot of care with the perennials. But what it does have is a lot of native shrubs and a lot of other shrubs that are perfectly well adapted and handle these conditions uh, of, of low water and um, low maintenance um, very well. So here's a non-native lilac, a really beauty, beautiful lilac. Um, and this is a native rose called Rosa woodsii. Um, in, the, in the background is more of the three-leaf sumac. Um, and here in front of us is a younger specimen of our big tooth maple, Acer grandidentatum, which is going to get probably 20 feet maybe. Um, behind that, there's a mahonia called desert mahonia, mahonia hematocarpa, which just finished blooming with beautiful yellow flowers that were fragrant. You could smell them from back here. And then behind that, you see more of that uh, Sphralsia fendleri with the orange flowers. And behind that is an, uh, the common Mount Mahogany, Circocarpus montanus. Um, then there's a selection of our Rocky Mountain juniper. Um, and in front of that uh, is a, a big rabbit brush, uh, native rabbit brush. And then here, this is wavy leaf oak. Is another um, uh, native oak. Um, and then the one over here is gamble oak. Um, both of them dwarf or small oaks to maybe 15 feet, maybe 20 at the most, around for at least around here with our watering. Um, so behind that, down below, there you can see there's a little plant called Genista Lydia. It just finished blooming. It's a, it's a type of broom, but very uh, tough and resilient. Makes a good low shrub in dry conditions. And here we have um, um, uh, Prunus, what is it? Uh, it's a dwarf almond. Uh, the almonds aren't really edible, but they make the fruit. Uh, it's a uh, Prunus tenella, 
and beautiful pink flowers early in the spring, very tough plant. And so behind that, we have another Russian um, hawthorn. Next to that, we have a, a plant select um, Budlia alternifolia argentia, the silver butterfly bush. And then next to that, we have a native fern bush, which blooms with um, white clusters of flowers, one of the most popular shrubs for, um, uh, for pollinators. Then here's another little leaf mountain mahogany. And then back behind that, we have another uh, New Mexican privet, Forestiera neo-mexicana. So across the way, this is a relatively new garden. So here we have um, um, Persia, Mexicana, um, a cliff rose plant, um, and then this orange is Asclepius tuberosa. Next to that, there's a, a, a salvia, a shrubby salvia, um, and then we have a few cacti that are doing well. That uh, silvery shrub there is winter fat. Um, and then to the left of that, there's an atroplex, a salt brush called Confertifolia. Um, and then we have a couple more lead plants there and one in lead plant here that's in bloom. We have um, uh, a service berry here. Um, a Utah service berry that's coming along. This is another fern bush. All of these are natives. Um, this is uh, Apache plume, a native. This is um, um, chocolate flower that's a native. This is big sage. Um, and then this is a, a, a prickly pear cactus that was a selection that um, I don't remember the name for right now, but um, actually is performing as a rather drought tolerant and, and showy um, shrub. I do want to point out our flags while we're right here. We have the earth flag on this side and the flag of interconnectedness on the other side. And those are kind of symbols of what we focus on here. You know, we're, we're very much into protecting the earth and defending the earth and, um, and doing what we can to support the earth. And so by our example and by the plants we sell and the soils that we sell, um, because uh, in spite of the fact that I've, we've talked a lot about plants and nothing really about soil, soil is where it begins. We have, if we have a healthy soil and a healthy soil biology, then the plants will be healthy. And if the plants are healthy, then the, the people who are eating those plants will be healthy. So it's this, that's part of the interconnectedness idea, is that we, we need to take th care of things from the ground up, and then everything from there on will, uh, will prosper. The main thing is to, to, to um, support health. And uh, so that's, those are the principles. And you can see, um, all of the things that we are growing um, with, um, with, with just the support of the health of the earth and, um, and, uh, and, and good um, horticulture, good care. Um, so we're lucky to be here, fairly close to the uh, foothills with this beautiful landscape. Um, you can see the, the flat irons are there and um, you can see all the way down the front range here. So we're very lucky to be here. This is our, 30, our 30th year in business and uh, people come to us from Colorado Springs and you know, Eastern Colorado and even have a, a customer from Nebraska because they know if they come here and get our plants that they will survive in their difficult conditions. If it can grow here and if we're selling it, we've already sort of pre-selected it to be adapted to Colorado conditions.